My name is Dennis. I'm an alcoholic. Hi. Hi. As I mentioned before in another one of my videos, it always makes me uh, feel comfortable to hear that. So when I start off a presentation or something, when I say, uh, my name is Dennis, I'm an alcoholic, I feel a whole lot more at ease. Uh, this topic um, of this video uh, is uh, having had a spiritual awakening or uh, from the 12th step of the big book, or Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, or it will be entitled uh, Spiritual Awakening of Recovering Chemically Dependent Persons. Uh, as I mentioned, I have done some other videos, uh, four of them in fact. One does the shoe fit, two the topic of what's normal, three acceptance, and four promises. Uh, since these are available on YouTube, uh, I'm going to go through them very rapidly. Uh, and so uh, uh, we will have time uh, to talk about the topic of hand, which is having had a spiritual awakening, what's that all about? So with that, uh, uh, a lot of times we get talking about the tremendous cost of, of chemical dependency. I'm not going to spend any time on that. Only the fact is that this is merely the tip of the iceberg. What's really under the iceberg is what concerns us. To identify the problem, as you know, uh, and many of us do, uh, is half the battle. If you owned a business and you couldn't identify the problem, you'd be out of business. So most of what happens in a chemical dependency care facility is the identifying the problem. In other words, does the shoe fit? If the shoe fits, we wear it, and we wear it, it becomes a little more comfortable, and after a while, it's so comfortable that you'd have to pry it off of us. So um, uh, the point here is most of what goes on in a chemical dependency care facility uh, is the identifying the problem. And what that's about is the first step. Uh, we admitted we were alcoholic, that our lives had become unmanageable. I'd like to say something about that to start with. The word alcoholic. Substitute your drug of choice when you say alcoholic. All right. We have way, I'm an alcoholic. If uh, I grew up in the 50s, I'm 80 years old, and if that stuff would have been around in the 50s, I would have been into it, whatever it was and whatever you're into or have been into, I would have been said, yes, let's do it, right? What it is we have is a disease. Now, if I say, let's have a show of hand, hands, how many of you would like to have a disease? There won't be many hands going up. But in fact, you can call it whatever you want to call it. Some people don't like to call it a disease. That's fine. Call it whatever you want. But what it is primarily is that this is a primary disease. If you had cancer, it's primary to other problems, right? It's progressive, it's chronic, and it's terminal. And as some folks you'll hear uh, in AA meetings or NA or, or CMA or 12-step meetings, uh, that this is cunning, baffling, powerful, and some people like to add the word patient. What's this about the personal consequences in our life? Um, this effect will affect or has affected every single area of our life. There will not be one area that will escape. Um, and that's, there's the areas, of course, relationships, physical, social, emotional, vocational, and spiritual. Four of those are considered vital signs in our life. Physical, social, emotional, and spiritual. Of those four, the one that's most neglected that we're going to talk about here is spiritual. Uh, spiritual is tougher to deal with, it's tougher to talk about, and so we don't hear as much about spiritual. In terms of for chemically dependent people, I merely call this dimension eight, having had a new awakening. Personal impact 
either you and you or other people uh, that you know have experienced a lot of these. These are symptoms of the disease um, and domestic abuse and relationships, broken homes, premature death and grieving, all of these have to do with the symptoms of this disease. Anybody here know anybody is not here anymore because of this disease? It's dead, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I lost, my mother drank herself to death, my bi biological mother. I lost a 17-year-old grandson to this disease. As alcoholic as me, he's dead. Grieving goes on forever then in these families. My daughter is still grieving. And, and right now we have um, 31 grandkids, 17 great-grandkids, 12 kids. That grieving for our family, especially my daughter, Margaret, will never end. Every time it's a, a birthday of Ryan or, or an uh, uh, anniversary of his death, we get an email and a Facebook posting. That's the reality of this disease. Let's just look for these purposes at family dysfunction. This is the real world that we live in. And <clears throat> what this is about uh, is the topic of what's normal from one of my uh, CDs or, and, and uh, what's on YouTube. Topic of what's normal. As you can see here, What's normal is in a certain place, but what's normal could be over here as well, toward the left. I came from an alcoholic home. My what's normal when I started using uh, might not have been the normal that somebody else's might have been. So there's big question marks about what's normal. For me, maybe there was more of a payoff in my using because I could get feeling this is a mood swing. I could get my moods changing pretty quickly as soon as I started drinking. Right, I could change my mood and get to a different place. And I'm looking for the high, so I bounce up this way, or from here, I bounce up this way. And after a while, what goes up must come down. I'm looking for this euphoria all the time, and that keeps going up, and then it comes down. So the what's normal keeps moving this way. And eventually, the what's normal, and how long does this take? I don't know. How much do I have to use? I don't know. How often do I have to use? I don't know. And especially why. Why do I have to be an alcoholic? Why do I have to be chemically dependent? I don't know. By the time I figure out why I'm an alcoholic, I'm going to be drunk. Some people need to know the why, and I can understand and appreciate that. I like to keep it a little more simple than that. My name is Dennis, and I'm an alcoholic. But at any rate, what's in the shit bag? In the shit bag are a lot of emotions. We talked about emotional a little earlier, and I could spend an hour in any one of these particular uh, videos, uh, but uh, what's in here? Uh, in this one, there's fear and anger and guilt and resentments and self-centeredness and low dignity and loneliness and self-pity, and a big one is despair. Many of these, there's a positive side. There's a positive side of guilt. If I didn't feel guilt, uh, I, how am I going to change? So when I start to look at that, I'm more apt to be able to change. It wasn't easy for me to sit there one time and have six of our 12 kids tell me they were afraid of me. Right? And so how did I feel? Guilty. Right? Did I want to continue to do that? First of all, I blame the counselor, the SOB, putting my kids up to that. Right. When I really had to look at it, it was a different situation. <coughs> I had to face up and, and face the guilt. Despair, no positive side of despair. Despair is when we hold up and we develop all the symptoms of acute agoraphobia, fear of people, places, and things, and the walls keep coming in. And we function in a very small area of friends and have all the symptoms of agoraphobia, despair. And there's no end to this. The shit bag keeps going on because this is progressive. It's not, this isn't enough. What happens is I affect 
a whole lot of other people. They get into my shit bag with me, and they have their own shit bags in. Well, how does that work? How can you possibly live with me and not take on some of my mood swings and my feelings? How could you, especially as a child, the resentments. Resentments are passed right along. Now, uh, I didn't mean for that to happen, but it did. I could fill this whole board with these. Imagine 12 kids, uh, a boss, my boss, my parents that, that didn't want me to come to town anymore even, right? Because there was always trouble. And they were embarrassed. Uh, how many other people get affected? That's the reality. That's just the way, it is what it is. There's another part here I won't even get into now because we don't have time, which has to do with relationships. The word co he'd have a spirituality uh, meeting uh, that I have. The only meeting that I'll uh, facilitate anymore is on spirituality. And I learned so much from that. But Bob would do that and he'd always say, I'm a pastor at a church. But don't get excited, we're not gonna talk about religion here. We're gonna talk about spirituality. That comes from the inside out. Our religion comes from the outside in. I can get very spiritual about my religion, but I get my spirituality also from a lot of other places. Spiritual bankruptcy, to identify that, there is no way I can tell you what that is for you until you experience it yourself. To sit here and listen to some uh, uh, fat old guy like me talk about this, uh, doesn't matter a whole lot. You, you need to live this yourself to learn this. You can't read about it either. I've done a lot of research. I, I do spirituality groups. I go to, I've been going to AA for 38 and a half years talking about spirituality. That's the greatest lesson for me. And I see it in people around me and my family and so forth and people that are sober. And I feel it myself, especially I get to see it in my own family. What a great payoff. Anyway, the spirituality is, is, is also hooked into all this and comes along with the rest of us in terms of spiritual recovery, which I'll talk about in a minute. It also expresses spiritual distress in a lot of other ways. I use the word spiritual bankruptcy because it's used in the big book. Eventually, eventually, we have some kind of spiritual awakening. I have never met anybody in AA, any length of time, that's sober, uh, that, this, that hasn't changed their beliefs and grown spiritually. I, I've never seen it happen, ever, ever. Hundreds and thousands of people with some meaning, so, sobriety going, going to meetings and reading, doing what they need to do. Never seen it happen. It's a great and the greatest of all payoffs. Spiritual awakening. I relate spiritual awakening to the promises. I see a, a, a combination between the two. This is the carrot at the end of the string. Uh, this is what our hope is. Our hope for all of you, your hope for each other, as you interact and go on, uh, our hope uh, is that this will happen for you. I've, made, uh, I've studied this for some time, many years. I haven't got out of my studies what I would get from going to meetings or listening to you. I can't listen to you. We could sit around in this room right now and talk about our higher power. And I couldn't come away from here not knowing God better but I've done some research. Um, and this is my research. The first bit of research is from, I went to a place that's a leading authority on spirituality and healthcare, happens to be a f medical, happens to be most of that, happens to be palliative care, people in, uh, toward the end of their life. But uh, um, I went there to learn, and I got a chance to talk as well some heavy hitters from all over the world there, people that 
medical school uh, uh, deans and people from all over the world, Spain and Scotland and uh, all Ireland and Australia and all over the world. And they came up with a consensus definition of spirituality. I'm going to read it. A uh, lot of big words, don't get excited. We'll take it apart a little bit. Dynamic and intrinsic aspect of humanity through which persons seek ultimate meaning, purpose, and transcendence, and experience relationship to self, family, others, community, society, nature, and the significant or sacred. Spirituality is expressed through beliefs, values, traditions, and practices prepared by George Washington University Medical School Institute for Spirituality and Health. And I went there and studied with those folks and spent some time and learned. I learned quite a bit. But again, not as much as I'd learned from going to a lot of AA meetings. Um, and so, um, I'm going to read um, uh, some statistics here, as quickly as I can, that they've determined. More than 70, uh, this is what they've done. More than 75% of U.S. medical schools have incorporated spirituality topics into their curriculum. Only three medical schools offered similar courses in 1993. Now it's 75. You can't graduate from a medical school now. 75% of them, unless you've taken coursework in spirituality. They must think it's pretty important. They started a movement that focuses on spirituality and health um, um, with like efforts from the international community of medical, religious, and spiritual leaders, this movement has developed into coordinating research involving millions of dollars for reliable, valid, scientific, and other objective and subjective information. Why? Why do they want to spend so much time? Now, the medical field has a, has a one-up on what we do in our field in terms of spirituality. They spent millions of dollars doing this. Why? Um, they, they should be considered a patient vital sign. One study found that 94% of patients admitted to hospitals believe that spiritual health is as important as physical health. 77% believe that physicians should consider their patients' spiritual needs as part of their medical care. However, 80% of reported physicians never or rarely discuss spiritual or religious issues with them. Polls of U.S. populations have consistently shown that 95% of Americans believe in God. However, 80% reported that physicians never or rarely discuss these issues. Those who experienced increased spirituality had better medical outcomes and less hospital admissions. 75% of studies showed a positive association with coping with illness, including prevention of illness, including depression, substance abuse, physical interest, and mortality. Uh, thanks for bearing with me on those statistics, but I think you can get a feel for how important this is and how important this movement is. Again, in our field, chemical dependency care, uh, we have lagged behind as far as I can determine. I'm going to talk just a bit about assessment. How do you assess your spirituality? Um, there are several tools to do this. Um, this is a whole list of the tools, and I'm not going to read through these. The one I decided to use I've researched these for four or five years, and the one that I decided to use, and the reason I went to George Washington University, is the FICA, F-I-C-A, that I'll talk about. And what that is, if you go, and, and, and anybody here that doesn't go on the internet at all, doesn't, doesn't relate to that, how to, how to get on, the, do a search on Google or anything? Most people do. If you go to Google and you bring up Google, and you go bring up FICA, uh, you'll get to this, what's on this. And then there's a self-assessment tool. So if you go to Google and you bring up this, you go down on the page a little bit and you'll see George Washington University, and then you click on it where it says self-assessment tool. Um, faith and belief. Do I have a spiritual belief? These are non-threatening, I think, to most people. 
Do you have a spiritual belief that helps you cope with stress? I use the word in there, unmanageabilities, because it relates to the first step. With illness gives my life meaning, importance. Is there a, a belief important to me? How does it influence how I think about my health care and illness? Does it influence my health care decisions? Community, do I belong to a spiritual community, church, temple, mosque, or other group? Am I happy there? Do I need to, uh, need to do more with the community? Do I need to search for another community? If I don't have a community, would it help if I found one? I can answer that question very quickly. My community <laughs> that gives me all of this is AA. Not to, not to uh, downplay my church as well, but that's where I get it. Uh, why sh uh, what should my plan of action be? There's another, one other reference before we move on. JACO is a uh, uh, credentialing source for hospitals. JACO. Hospitals live in fear of JACO because if JACO doesn't approve what they're doing, they're in deep trouble. They came out with this statement. Revised its accreditation standards require the administration of a spiritual assessment. Spiritual assessments are now mandated in a number of settings. That's psych and uh, you know, uh, social workers and so forth. Including organizations such as those providing addiction services. Jacob must think it's important as well. Uh, in the definition, the most, uh, most referred to in the, any definition of spirituality is meaning and purpose. And the most referred to in all of these people uh, is a guy named Victor, Victor Frankel. Victor Frankel is a survivor of Auschwitz. And talks, he talks in his book how he survived by having meaning or purpose. How did he survive the gas chamber um, and being burned to a crisp? And it talks about how he did that, meaning or purpose. The word suffering is used a lot in terms of describing people with physical suffering, physical suffering. How about emotional suffering? Do we also suffer emotionally? And do we also suffer spiritually? I say absolutely. And suffering is, um, su from suffering to triumph. Um, go listen to people, speakers at AA meetings and so forth, and, and listen to their stories, and, and, and then you decide if they've gone from suffering to triumph. I don't, amend, I don't mind a real good drunkalog sometimes, as long as somebody shares the pain as well. Um, there's a word he uses called existential vacuum. What does that mean? It means we f start functioning in a vacuum. And what that is is boredom. Uh, we're not looking outside of ourselves, we're looking into ourselves. Even in finding meaning, we can look into ourselves for a different purpose and outside of ourselves both. But we're, when we just withdraw and are lonely into ourselves, we function in what, what he calls as an existential vacuum. He sold over 10 million copies of this book, by the way. Meaning of suffering and responsibility. Turning suffering into achievement. How many people do you know that are in recovery and you look at them and you, you somehow wonder how they do it and you admire them and you wonder what's happened in their life? They've literally turned their suffering into achievement. Uh, they've taken their guilt and turned it into an opportunity. We root, we root for, the, for the underdogs, don't we? Watch, a, watch a, a football game or a sporting event, hockey or whatever, and one team is such an underdog, like the, like the Minnesota Vikings, sorry. And even if you don't have a vested interest in the Minnesota Vikings, you go, now they're an underdog, right? But even if you didn't have an interest in them, who are you gonna cheer for if you don't have any interest at all? Don't you cheer for the underdog? Don't you like to see people come out of the ashes and, and achieve a whole different life? Doesn't that bring you up also to see what's happened with certain people and to see what they've done with their life? It's a program of attraction, what AA is. Driving from experience and incentive to action means we share our strength, our hope, and our experiences. I look at the projection like this. I'm going to ask you in a few minutes to consider this. 
when you look at this particular film in Nicaragua. Um, in terms of relationships with other people, um, if we go the other way, of course, we're going to get resentments and we don't, we don't care at all. But if we have an interest, then we go to concern. Are we sympathetic to others? Now, we can find sympathy in the dictionary between uh, shit and syphilis, right? But moving up the ladder a little bit, empathy. Do we have feelings of empathy for others, especially those who are also suffering? Compassion, compassion, and love. There's always something around the next corner spiritually, always. And when we're recovering spiritually, the word in the, in the definition is transcendence. Don't we transcend from one point to another? I say yes. And what are the barricades in the spiritual recovery that goes on? There are barricades and there's pitfalls and there's tests and so forth. We get through those and we get stronger, we get more spiritual. Here's the steps, you're familiar with the steps. God is mentioned or implied seven times in these steps. This is our reference. This is my reference. Hopefully it will become and is yours. My favorite step is step 11. Sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that, carry that out that says a lot. Talks about meditation. There's nothing inconsistent with, with meditating and doing some of these things. Mindfulness, cognitive behavioral therapy, reaching out to psychologists and others. Meditation. Uh, there's nothing inconsistent with that in this step 11. And prayer as well. How long does this take from get to point A to point? I don't know. What's in the serenity prayer? We say it all the time. What does it mean? That's a lot. There's a lot in the serenity prayer. We really take it apart and think about it. I have the toughest time with the last part, the wisdom to know the difference. Again, this transcendence goes on from a certain point, and we bring our families along with us in our spirituality as well. And then there are roadblocks. Eventually, we get to a point where we can talk about step 12 with a real knowledge and understanding of what that is. To some, maybe, of a lot of exp spiritual experiences and peak spiritual experiences. Think of those. Use those. I have uh, two questions for you, basically. Um, and we talked about surrender. In surrender, let me ask you this. Uh, who are you going to surrender to? Who are you going to surrender to? You say, I'm gonna, I, I, I need help. I need, I need to surrender. Who do you surrender to? In the terms of gratitude. If you're really feeling grateful, and there's always something around the next corner in terms of gratitude, always. Uh, and we come to believe that. Some of these other areas have a diminishing return. How much money can you make? How good can your relationships get? How good can you feel after a while? You get to be somebody my age, right? But there's no <laughs> limit to spiritual growth, none. It just keeps happening and happening and happening, and we come to expect that. So who are you going to be grateful to? Ask yourself who, or if you prefer what, what are you grateful to? Who do you surrender to? Finally, in the definition, the word sacred is mentioned. Uh, I don't have any slides on sacred. All I have is my, def my own definition, my own feelings about what is sacred to me. These are personal feelings. Um, and um, I want to share with you a prayer I wrote for myself when I was sober eight years, and I'm sober 38, 30 years ago. I've never shared this prayer with anyone. I want to share it with you. Um, God, Holy Trinity, Jesus Christ, and Holy Spirit, thank you for this day with thee and this moment of great peace and serenity. And your many gifts for me, my friends, my family, my life in sobriety, and my spiritual recovery. Please let me understand your will for me and the strength in your grace for me to be what you expect to see. 
an instrument of your love and peace for me. I share that with you with the, with the thought that, for me, if I'm going to share my own uh, concept, what I consider sacred, I need to understand other people's concept of, of what they consider sacred as well and, and, and find out more about that. For example, the beautiful native traditions and, and beliefs. Um, uh, mother, father, uh, community. Um, and uh, how about, uh, you know, if I, if, if I believed in angels, in a guardian angel, if I believed in reincarnation, the be most beautiful expression, I think, for me as a Buddhist, from the Buddha, in terms of uh, expressing um, the spirituality. And that is meant, as uh, it says, namaste, namaste. And what that merely means is, I bow to the spirit within you, um, meaning that you have a spirit. It's intrinsic. And if you say back to me, I, Dennis, I bow to the spirit within you, it means I have the same thing. It's a beautiful um, uh, expression of spirituality. Spirituality, for me, is the frosting on the cake. Don't get no better than that. And the sacred part, even more so. Uh, and it says we'll suddenly realize what God is doing for us, what we could not do for ourselves. And we have this concept of God as we understood him. Um, and if we can assess that for ourselves, uh, look at it, ask others, talk about it. Don't have to talk about religion. Talk about spirituality and what God means for you. I only hope all of you can, can do that in your life and do it in an increasing manner. Um, and that you will also find as much that's been possible for me and my wife, my children, um, that we have found. Uh, we are so grateful. Um, we are grateful to the program uh, that literally saved my life, Alcoholics Anonymous. And the people in AA had a way of telling me they loved me before I loved myself, literally. And that's true. And I kept hearing it, and finally I came to believe. I came to believe in a power that greater than myself uh, could rescue me. Now, I'm going to go on and, and uh, at this point, uh, part two, um, and, uh, and share with you uh, the, the experience from uh, Nicaragua. I was recruited to uh, visit a rehab camp in Nicaragua. I was going to share with you the uh, songs of Amazing Grace from, uh, from different sources, but uh, I'm going to share this, uh, this video with you of uh, uh, from Nicaragua, and I ask you one thing uh, when you watch this. I'm going to ask that you consider the one chart and s consider how you relate to these people that are different than you in a different culture. Uh, and uh, uh, how, how do you relate to them? Do you relate with uh, sympathy, uh, empathy, compassion, or even love? Think about that. And this is the song of Amazing Grace from Nicaragua, and uh, um, is CD Rehab Camp in Nicaragua. I'm going to go through these slides with you rather quickly in deference to time, uh, but I was recruited by um, a group that, uh, of missionary type people who were concerned about continuing to put their money, a lot of money, uh, into this rehab camp in Nicaragua. These people are very involved, especially the uh, two or three of them are very wealthy people uh, in Haiti, the two poorest countries in the Western Hemisphere, and then Nicaragua. And they were a little concerned about this rehab camp, and they asked me to go make some recommendations. It turned out to be a very spiritual experience for me. So with that, I'll go through these slides uh, rather quickly. 
Here's the countryside. At the camp, they grow uh, uh, coffee. Uh, the road's going up there. It was pretty hot. Here's how people live there. Um, when I got to the camp, there's a, I had a translator with me. There's a guard, guard gate, uh, which uh, concerned me a little bit. I've never seen a guard gate at a CD rehab camp. Um, uh, any, uh, anybody reminded of anything when you look at this light? Anybody remember Jim Jones University? Anybody? Yeah, Jim Jones. Look a little like Jim Jones. People there sing every day, about three hours a day. And they sing spiritual songs. They really get into it. Uh, the guy that ran the camp, Juan, is, has the only block construction building there. I went in to meet Ron, Juan. I was a little concerned. Uh, these are uh, people that are involved in this camp are also re uh, revolutionary fighters. Remember the big war going on there, the communists and so forth. Um, and so uh, um, these people are very interested in other people in the country, uh, despite their being communist. Uh, and so I went in to meet Juan, and here's Juan. Scared the shit out of me a little bit, right? Look at this guy, right? And he doesn't especially like people coming into the camp, especially even people are helping support the camp. Who, uh, uh, who knows what that, those pictures are behind us? Who are those guys? Don't, doesn't anybody recognize these guys? Wow. Yeah, Bob, Bob and Bill, the guys that started AA. And um, I said, hey, hey, Bob and Bill, see, see. So he got up, gave me a big hug, talked about how long he'd been sober and I'd been sober. And we took this picture and he saw that as a positive omen that uh, Bill W. was right between us, Bob. And, and I thought, all right, uh, I'm going to do okay here. I brought some big books, donated from Hazelden, and some 24-hour books to give one. Um, people, here's how people live there. Right. There's 70 guys living in this little adobe. Um, bunk beds are three high. People hadn't bathed there in, uh, in uh, three, four days because when the water, uh, water, water falls running like this, they get washed downstream um, and die. Um, this is a little nicer place. It has kind of a lanai to it. Must be phase two. Uh, this is a med room. They bring people in there and they quite often die there. Um, they have enough food for one day. Here's the kitchen area. I hate rice and beans, but I thought I better start eating rice and beans or I was going to die. <laughs> and uh, interesting here, I'll go through this quickly, the guy, a guy in the blue shirt down by the statues uh, is a guy from the camp that uh, um, Javier, one of the uh, wealthy families in the country. These are coffee producers. Uh, the Medea, Medea family. Javier uh, uh, was an amateur boxer and he trained this guy from the camp uh, how to box. And uh, he uh, went to London eventually, won the championships for the country, and won a gold medal right from the camp. Uh, Juan and I are, are pretty tight right now, as you can see. <coughs> and uh, um, supposedly, right? <laughs> and uh, he asked me what I wanted, and I said, I'd like to speak to the group every day, the big group. I want my own group of guys to work with. And, uh, and these are the, the fellows that, um, that they picked for me to, uh, that I could work with every day I was there and have group with. They didn't have anything like groups like we have here or anything like that. Uh, do you see the guy in the middle there in the short sleeve shirt with the glasses? He said something in group one day that I'll never forget, a very spiritual thing. Uh, he took his hands, and we were talking about what's going to keep us sober, and he took his hands and he, and he held out his left hand and he said, this is my Jesus, and he held out his right hand and he said, this is my AA, and he put them together and he raised his hands up over his head and he said, these two together will keep me sober. And it clarified a lot of things for me. Uh, there are excellent treatment programs that are, are, are Christ-based. Um, Salvation Army, uh, um, uh, Union Gospel Mission, uh, Teen Challenge, uh, Adult and Teen Challenge, and so forth. Uh, 
but it doesn't have to be exclusive. They, um, um, that's the group uh, I became very close to. I became clo close to the 200 men and women there. One day I asked if they knew Amazing Grace and they said no, well, they didn't. And I was surprised. Uh, everything, they, they didn't know Amazing Grace and they wrote the words down on the board and they practiced one whole day 20 or 30 times singing and they sat me down and they sang Amazing Grace to me. And I'm going to play that for you. And again, when you watch this, um, I would ask you to take a look at this and, and ask yourself how you relate to these people Emp with empathy, compassion, or love. And is any, if anybody here can tell me what you think is the difference between these people and you, uh, if you can answer this question either with empathy, compassion, or love, um, then you're well on your way uh, to, you fit in very well um, uh, in AA or NA or CA or CMA, uh, because that's how we relate to each other in these programs, uh, with empathy, compassion, and love. Um, so with that, uh, let me just play um, Amazing Grace for you, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll adjourn. Uh, but I do, uh, and I'm going to uh, play my thank you to them as well.
This is one of the greatest gifts. Is this algo, algo muy importante? I have ever received Nunca in my sobriety. En mi to think that Para dar, you es, learned this song in this short amount of time en este corto tiempo, um, is a tribute to all of you. Es un a todos I deeply appreciate this. Lo, lo siento, o sea, Amen. This will be a gift that I will bring home and share from you to the people that I know in AA back in the U.S. Esto va a ser un regalo que yo que yo voy a llevar de ustedes hacia mi grupo allá de Estados Unidos de Colcos Anónimo. Thank you for your permission to let me film this. Gracias por el permiso que me dieron para para grabarlos. It will go for a great and spiritual purpose. Esto va para un, un gran, este, From you to your fellow people in rehab centers. De ustedes hacia un centro de rehabilitación. In the United States. Estados Unidos de Norteamérica. This is your gift. Este va a ser un regalo de ustedes. To them. Para ellos. And I deeply appreciate this. Thank you. Gracias. Again, uh, let me just finalize by saying I urge all of you to strongly consider the spiritual part of your recovery program, your spirituality. A uh, little more difficult to look at uh, than some of the other things that are plenty difficult to look at in themselves. Uh, your anger, or your fear, or your resentments, or your guilt, and all of these things, these emotional situations. But uh, I urge you to look at um, also the spiritual side. That dimension of you that's considered a vital sign as well as the physical uh, the emotional, the social, and the spiritual. Uh, there are some ways that you can do that. You can do that by reaching out and asking uh, others to help you with that. Uh, you can ask your counselors to help you with that. Uh, if you happen to, uh, for the purposes of this, be in a treatment program, or ask people, or your sponsors and others, to just ask them to define what spirituality is for them. Uh, and. Uh, um, come along with them on their ride, on their spiritual ride. Uh, so with that, I really appreciate your patience and, uh, uh, and your hanging in there to, to watch this with me. Uh, thank you very much.